Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Savior. God be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift that your faithful people offer you true and laudable service. Grant that we may run without stumbling to obtain your heavenly promises through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove your evil deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. If your sins are like scarlet, will they become like snow? If they are red like crimson, will they become like wool? Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
A reading from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, as his right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith during all your persecutions and the afflictions that you are enduring. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was. Out of the crowd. But on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The Gospel of Christ. Please be seated. Good morning, friends. As you've seen in your bulletin, our sermon today is the address that the Right Reverend Craig Loya, our bishop in the Diocese of Minnesota, gave to the convention that gathered on Thursday evening, Friday, and Saturday in Rochester. So as we're getting that queued up and about to play, um, I think it's possible that some of our kids are gonna go on a journey and have their own kind of praying and worship while we're listening to the address. Um, it's possible that the choir might want to relocate to be where they can see. And if you're in the back and you're having trouble hearing, please just stand up and come join us closer to the front. Um, what a gift it is to get to be connected to a hundred other Episcopal congregations at the convention, for those of us who are able to be there, and this morning as we listen to our bishop. I would encourage you to be listening in his address for the three invitations he's giving faith communities in Minnesota. And I'm gonna come back and make a couple of comments when it's over. I'm gonna start with a reading from the 11th chapter of the book of Genesis. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. 
And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people, and they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will be scattered abroad from there over the face of all the earth. And they left off building the city. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. Therefore, it was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over all the face of the earth. I don't know about you, but I have always found this story to be confusing. (laughs) And honestly, even a little troubling. I mean, the premise seems like a good thing, right? Human beings have rallied around a common cause. They have united across all their vast diversity They've achieved something great together. But then God swoops in like an angry toddler and just knocks the blocks over, (laughs) scattering and confusing the builders as if to neutralize some perceived threat to God's supremacy. I mean, it just seems petty. And not at all the character of God that we imagine. So what did the builders do wrong? And what was the point of God's punishment? My understanding of this story totally shifted this summer when I read a brief commentary on it by Rabbi Ari Lam. There's a number of curious things about this story. In the first place, while we are told at the beginning that the whole earth spoke the same language. The verses that immediately precede it tell us the exact opposite. (laughs) The descendants of Noah near the end of chapter 10 have been scattered across the earth, each speaking their own language. (laughs) So which is it? it would seem that the plot has taken a sudden and unplanned turn in the space between two verses. Even more, the wording in Hebrew when they say, let us make bricks for ourselves, is the exact same phrasing that is used to describe the Israelites' experience of slavery in the land of Egypt, where they were forced to make bricks to build an empire of oppression. Those are the only two places in the Bible where the phrase for making bricks is used in exactly that way. So, that's on purpose. The editors of the book of Genesis want us to recall the story of slavery in Egypt when we hear the people say, let us make bricks. It's an awesome story. The layers go on and on. But the bottom line is that it turns out this story is fundamentally a story about how diversity is God's design and uniformity is human regression. It's Pharaoh who enforces a false uniformity by building. God insists that creation run wild with diversity. 
And besides that, if you remember a few chapters back in Genesis, maybe you've heard that story. When God created human beings, God doesn't appoint them to be builders, but gardeners, putting us in Eden to till and to keep. See, we don't have to make a name for ourselves. We already have a name, which is beloved. So our sin at Babel is that we traded our vocation as gardeners for the seduction of becoming builders. God wasn't trying to stop us. God was trying to save us and to bring us back. Two weeks ago, October 11th, was exactly 20 years since the Friday evening when I was ordained to the transitional diaconate in tiny little Trinity Church in Mission, South Dakota. I only caught it, like you often do with these things, when I sat down to write my message for our weekly email newsletter and realized it was the feast of St. Philip the Deacon. It hit me like a punch in the gut, honestly. And that's partly because milestones always remind us that the thread of our life spools out with such breathtaking speed. And we are given to the people with whom we live and work and worship for such a preciously short time. A part of that was because as I sat there reflecting on all those years, I was reminded again that the Episcopal Church has been having essentially the exact same conversation for the entirety of the two decades that I have served it as an ordained person. We are anxious about our decline. And we wring our hands about what we're going to do. Or we bring in fancy speakers to give us some great new plan. Or we distract ourselves with petty arguments, pointing our fingers at one another. How can we attract more members? What will we do with these treasured, sacred buildings? We have spent so much time frantically trying to rebuild some imagined tower of church, and I have mostly gone along for that ride. I, many of you know this, I have even played a leading role in some of the Episcopal Church's denomination-wide attempts to do this. They have all failed. And as I sat staring at that blank screen on that afternoon, I was embarrassed by the anxious ways that I have spent too much of the precious little time that I have. And frankly, if there was a solution, we would have found it by now. (laughs) The truth is the tower we think we used to be has been almost completely toppled to the ground by cultural, economic, and historical forces that none of us caused and none of us can stop but we are exhausted from trying. We have worn ourselves out believing the lie that we can make a name for ourselves again if we just make enough bricks. My heart's deepest hope is that as a diocese, This convention can mark a turning point. Not because 
we discover some grand new plan for rebuilding our beloved tower. But because this is where we decide to set aside our ambition to be builders and take up again our calling to be gardeners. I'm fr from the perspective that I have as your bishop, I see about three options for us. We can just keep doing most of the same things in most of the same ways that we've done for so long. And, you know, that might not be an entirely bad option. Along the way, we can entertain ourselves with some petty fights that we make up <laughs> or by passing the hot potato of blame around between the clergy and the lay leaders and the bishop and the diocesan staff or, you know, whoever else we can find to catch it and play the game for a while. That's a choice. We could stay here, play out the thread, and have a little dysfunctional fun along the way. <laughs> we could also, and this is probably a less likely option, we could also just retreat and give up. We could walk away and fly the white flag and go find something else to do. I don't think that's going to happen, but who would blame us if it did? But what I want to wonder about today is, I wonder if we could, instead of white-knuckled grasping or indignant surrender, we could just stay here, but let go. Not give up, but let go of those heavy bricks in our hands and just play in the dirt together for a while, waiting to see what God might grow when we aren't keeping God at arm's length with all our building. So Minnesota, can this be a turning point where we stop, at least for a season, worrying about how to build and return to, pra to the practice of gardening God's church for God's world? So what if we do? Just pretend that we say yes to that question for a minute. What might it look like for us to try to do that? There are three things today that I want to invite us to consider together about what it might look like to return to our vocation as gardeners. First, what if we spend some time not doing much else but tending to the root system? Nothing can grow tall or wide or bear any fruit at all until it has first grown deep. Two years ago, we identified four diocesan priorities, discipleship, justice, faithful innovation, and congregational vitality. Discipleship is without question the keystone priority. That's the only way that God will use us to grow the deep and thick root system that can produce the fruits of justice, innovation, and vitality. So what I want to invite all of us into today is to spend at least the next year focusing almost exclusively on discipleship. That is, participating fully in God's life by intentionally apprenticing ourselves moment by moment to Jesus. Focusing on those simple practices of daily prayer and dwelling in scripture, sharing our lives in real ways with each other, and coming alongside the poor and the marginalized. I'm asking you to commit to this yourself and to invite everyone in your faith community to be part of a small discipleship group in the next year that is committed to doing this with other people. There's a new resource some of you have seen. There's flyers on your table from the Episcopal Church that's called Centered, which is really nothing more than a simple way to gather in small discipleship groups to support and share with one another as we tend to our root system. I, 
So I hope, and I, I really mean this, I hope that every Minnesota Episcopalian will become part of one of these small gatherings this year. You don't have to use centered, but it's simple and it's easy to use, and it's all people need to join up with three or four or five other people. So can we gather ourselves into primarily small communities to deepen our roots together? Two. What if we tried to relearn together how to consciously and intentionally let God lead in our lives and in our ministries? You've often heard me say this before, and I'm not the only one who says it, and I didn't make it up, but in the Episcopal Church, as much as I love us, we often operate as if we are functional atheists. <laughs> we are so good at talking about God as if God is a wonderful and interesting and great idea. <laughs> but it is less often that we talk about God as if we expect God to show up and do something in our lives and in our ministries. Gardeners can't force anything to grow. Gardeners can only cultivate the conditions that allow life to flourish. It's nature and God doing their thing that gives the growth. I will stand here at my first in-person convention and admit to you without shame or fear and say that I do not know how to save or fix the church. And you don't either. But the good news is that saving and fixing the church, turns out, it's not my job. <laughs> and it's not your job. The church is God's job. Our job is to stand out in the fields and let God use us in whatever way God will to cultivate the fruits of love, of hope, of reconciliation, of forgiveness, of peace, of joy. It's fine, we can bring whatever tools we can afford along with us and we can do our best to care for those tools together. But whether, how, and where the fruit sprouts and ripens is not anything you or I can control. So we may as well relieve ourselves of the burden of trying to make or repair so many more bricks. If God is who we and the scriptures claim God is, I mean, just go with that for a minute, right? If God is who we really claim God to be, then honestly, God's going to go be about the project of healing the world with love, whether the Episcopal Church is on board or not. And no matter how small, large, wealthy, or poor we might happen to be along the way. So can we lay down the burden? of thinking it's our job to force the fruit to grow and learn to simply recognize and follow where God's already leading us. And three, can we help God cultivate a diverse church ecology? That's why I started with that story. Diversity is God's design the drive for uniformity is part of how we distort the ways that we are made in God's image. And that's not just true for language, nation, race, tribe, and culture, though it's certainly true for all of that. It's also true for the way the church expresses and organizes itself. I mean, it's strange that for the past hundred years or so, give or take a few hundred years, <laughs> we have essentially had one mental picture of what it means to be a local community of disciples, right? You can all recite it. You got a building, you have a priest, people come to the building for an hour or so on Sunday, and you offer programs and services that people either want or they don't. And while there's a lot about that model without question that is important and life-giving and it's not totally going anywhere anytime soon, it tends to focus more on the question of how do we get people to show up for our stuff rather than how are we helping people show up looking and acting like Jesus in the world. 
And the other thing that I'm scratching my head about is that we've somehow along the way adopted the mindset that bigger is better. I mean, small communities are where we can really share our lives together. Small communities is where we can help each other become apprentices of Jesus more fully. I mean, somewhere along the way, that drive that we picked up for every church to follow the same model and for churches to be big is Pharaoh pushing us to make more bricks and build Babel. I'm going to say something crazy now. (laughs) We often assume, I think, that our future as a diocese will involve fewer congregations. We imagine that in the future we'll have fewer congregations than we do today. And when we think that, what we then do is we assume that our work right now is just, a phone, is just to turn it in and start to downsize appropriately. But what if that's not true? What if our future looks like more faith communities than we have now, but they are mostly much smaller? What if God is urging us in this season to form Gatherings of five to ten people who meet in living rooms or the beauty of the outdoors who pray, this will shock you, while they're fishing (laughs) or backpacking together or after Sunday morning soccer games or whatever. What if we form small groups who will till justice by listening and feeding their neighbors or by facilitating community, community conversations and engagement around race? What if we did that? And then what if say 15 or 20 of those small groups joined up with one of our larger traditional communities once a month for a Eucharist and a story slam about all the things they're seeing God doing in their lives and in the world. What if we just followed hundreds of seedling crazy ideas for how we can connect the gospel of love with a world that is starving for it and that evidently is not finding it in a lot of traditional spaces? What if we just followed that, held it lightly, and see what God grows? In the coming months, Canon Blair Pogue is going to begin gathering some groups to try to do just that. She's going to begin gathering a group of us to begin playing with what that might actually look like. How might we gently help God shift the landscape and the center of gravity in the diocese to what is small? and joining God in the world. I don't know if any of it's going to work at all. (laughs) And I don't know what will happen, but we can totally do it. It's a real option for us on our buffet of options in this moment. That's my invitation tending to the root system as disciples so that we can learn how to let God lead us. I mean, like really lead us. And then join God in cultivating a wildly diverse ecology. We can't control what's going to happen. But we can till the soil, we can water it, we can weed it, and we can see what God might do. I believe that God is not done with this church. And I know my own sinfulness well enough to know that there is no way God is done with me. (laughs) You know, and if a wild revival of the small, like I'm describing, seems hard to believe to you, then you are welcome to join me the next time I visit Emmanuel Church in Alexandria and see the way that they have gardened a food shelf for 40 years that now feeds an entire Minnesota county. After we tour the food shelf, you can join us as four generations joyfully pose for a picture with Big Ole. You are welcome to stand next to me 
in front of the bulletin board at Holy Trinity in International Falls and see all those photos and news clippings of the way they rally their entire town to fill every crack they can see with God's abundant love. You can come with me and sit with me on a Friday evening in Chatfield and listen to that group talk about how they are listening deeply to their neighbors, literally going around and knocking on the doors to get to know the stories of what God is doing around their church building. And after the conversation, just for fun, we can drive along the Root River over to Rushford. And if you have any doubts about God's goodness or God's power, I promise you, that the driftless in October will knock all of those out entirely. And if you don't want to hang out with me, that's fine. <laughs> you can follow Father Neptali Rodriguez of a weekend as he surfs from quinceañera to quinceañera to a Saturday night and then a Sunday morning liturgy for three generations of immigrant families who know that God is real and alive and good. You can join the folks over at Holy Trinity in St. Paul for a Sunday morning that every time feels like being wrapped in a warm blanket of love on a cold Minnesota day. And if you don't want to go that far, you can walk down the street and sit in the courtyard at Calvary Church and look across the street as the fullest imaginable spectrum of human beings walks in and out of that clinic all day long all of them seeking healing, just like the crowds pushing in to touch Jesus. If you want to talk about the privilege that bishops have, that is it. I get to see all of that, all the time, every single day. And I want so badly for you to see it too to come up in the plain with me and look over this beautiful diocese at 30,000 feet, or at least to ride along next to me in the diocesan Volkswagen. <laughs> this is a moment for us to decide, Minnesota. Are we going to keep trying to be builders? Or can we take up gardening again? I can't answer for you, but I'm gonna do my best to say yes to God's invitation to set down the brick building and to relearn how to garden. I really hope that you'll join me and say yes to that invitation too. The world can be such a lonely desert parched with suffering and injustice and sorrow. And the God that I know and meet in all of you every day longs to reforest that world, not with more towers that impress, but with fruit that nourishes, with love and justice and joy. We don't know what will happen. We don't know what the future might hold. But let's use what tiny little time we have to dig into God's soil, to help the whole world see and know what unimaginably good things God and God alone can bring forth submitted to you on this, the 28th day of October, in the city of Rochester, the center of the world's healing. I am your deeply grateful companion along the way. First of all, I want to say that if any of you are in the construction or building trades, <laughs> it was a metaphor. <laughs> there were three things 
he invited us to do. Tend to our root system. Relearn together how to let God lead and help God create a diverse church ecology. We have muscle memory in all of those endeavors here at St. Luke and James. When he's talking about sinking deep roots, remembering how to, t how to tend to the life of our root system, he's talking about discipleship, what it means to apprentice ourselves to the way of Jesus, to try to learn from Jesus how to live. The centered curriculum that he spoke about, we ran a beta test of that last year here at St. Luke and James. There are people who've done it. But there are other ways in which we already gather as disciples in small groups. In, I had to make a list because I couldn't remember them all. In the sacred groundwork that, that has happened here already. In the healing prayer ministry that happens here. In groups that serve a particular purpose and team like our Haiti Commission, the Dream Team, the Finance Committee, the Vestry, hospitality ministry. The choir isn't a particularly small, small group, but they are still a community of disciples that are praying together through music. We know already what it means to be groups of people who share our lives deeply. When he talks in that second point about relearning together how to let God lead, he told us that he thought building, tending a garden would be better than building a tower. And my friends, we've already got a tower. And the good news, and maybe some of the bad news, is that there's some stuff growing in it. <laughs> what does it look like to say yes to God's life here? To stretch this metaphor, how do we build a green roof on this tower we have, this traditional congregation that we have? To let the innumerable 12-step and arts groups that use our space every day, and the innumerable neighbors and children who use our building every day to be part of our way of tending the garden here on this corner of 46 and Colfax. The third thing he talked about was helping God to create a diverse church ecology, and I'm pretty sure that y'all know that the consolidation process that happened here and the work of the dream team, we got some muscle memory on that one already. There is so much muscle and skill built here in this place that Bishop Loya asked Fiona and Rosemary to present to the entire convention the story of what's happened at St. Luke and James over the past several years. And that video went out in your email, uh, and it is such good news. It is such, such good news. Uh, when you see them next, give them a big old high five. If all this talk about church and decline and building and tending is confusing or uninteresting to you, the good news in this sermon for every single one of us here today is that in the midst of political violence and the rising tide of vocal white supremacy and environmental collapse and all of the other things that keep us up at night, we are still invited to be apprentices of Jesus of Nazareth. There is more yet that we get to learn about what it looks like to follow Jesus in the world. That is good news for every single one of us. And so the question then is, how am I called right now, in this moment, in this place, with all the things going on, how am I called right now to deepen my root system, to apprentice myself more deeply to the way of Jesus? Bishop Loya is going to be here in 10 days on Wednesday night, November 9th. I hope you will come and celebrate with him and with all of us the incredible things the Holy Spirit is doing around here, and come and ask him what he meant by any of these things that pushed a button for you. There is so much good news that we have to share. Amen. Amen. Hi, good morning. I'm Max Athorn. I'm your senior warden. Um, I was uh, asked today to give our uh, brief stewardship talk, and I will do so quite briefly, um, with just two, two basic comments. Um, the first is 
to recognize the explicit link um, between stewardship and our annual drive and our annual budgeting process, um, which uh, links directly to an invitation to join us at the forum this, uh, this morning after church. It will also be relatively brief um, and simple. Uh, it's a part one of two, which is really just a budgeting for church 101. Um, you know, take, take a look at some spreadsheets, sit next to somebody, just get the lay of the land of what this is and what it means. And um, we're not going to talk about 2023 today. Uh, it's really just a matter of getting the stuff in front of you so that we're all working with some of the same information. We all kind of understand the same uh, infrastructures that we work from. Um, and then perhaps that gives all of us a little bit more of a context to give some direct feedback when it comes time to talk about the budget itself, which we'll do uh, starting with a little bit of a listening session in two or three weeks. The second thing, uh, just very briefly on the topic of stewardship as it pertains to this process of budgeting, is that it has been suggested to me for many years, both in both legacy congregations and in our newly consolidated one, well, we could raise $10,000 anytime we want to. Has anyone heard that? Mm-hmm. So I'll just posit respectfully a question for our reflection. If this is true, what does it mean for our annual pledging? So to borrow a part of Bishop Loya's holy imagery, we need to commit to the act of faith that will allow us to tend our garden more proactively. Increase your pledge. <laughs> Consider a donation pledge commitment as an act of faith in where we are going and God's work in getting us there. Thanks. Please stand and join me in defiantly proclaiming an affirmation of faith. We believe in God, who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word in flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us the Holy Spirit, who lives and reigns with God in the Holy Spirit, and we trust in God. We are called to be a church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect and creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Creator God, autumn brings the beauty of changing leaves, children going back to school, plentiful harvest, and in our church communities, a time to reflect on the abundance we enjoy and our call to be faithful stewards of all we have received. May your church overflow with the spirit of generosity so that your dreams for all people can be fulfilled. Gracious God, wise creator, we pray for our church leadership, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Craig, our bishop, and the clergy and laypersons at Saints Luke and James. We give profound thanks for your presence in the discernment that brought Susan to be our new rector. May your grace continue to guide and direct our shared ministry. Gracious God, hear our prayer. Gentle God, your bountiful love is showered on all people unconditionally. May Jesus' example of compassion, justice, and devotion arouse those in positions of authority to serve all people with dignity and for the common good. Gracious God, Hear our prayer. 
Benevolent God, you taught us to be extravagant in loving your creation. Now inspire us to share our gifts in service of others and to fulfill our mission at Saints Luke and James. At this time, when many focus on our divisions, may we proclaim the love of Jesus that unites us. Gracious God, comforting God, we lift up to you those who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit, and ask that your wisdom and courage surround those who minister to their needs. We pray especially for Anne, Annette, Ben, Barbara, Charlie, Chris and Jerry, David, Don, Ella, Janice, for Jeff, Jim, Joan, Joanne, Joe, John, Kathy, for Kay, Lynn, Mark, Marlis, Maxine, Michael, the Merzada family, for Nancy V, Nick, Raina, Richard and Sandra, Russell, Sarah, Sarah V, Susan, Scott and Kim Michelle, Ted, Theo, Tom, and for those recovering from COVID. Please add your own names, either silently or aloud. Gracious God, transforming God, you promise new life to those who have died and comfort for those in their sorrow. Shine your light on those we mourn today, especially Al C, Holly A, and Marnie R. Gracious God, Abundant creator, from your plentiful gifts, we present to you our own first fruits as we harvest our time, talent, and treasure for your kingdom. May they be a blessing to our faith community, our neighbors, and the world around us. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
kids who want to come up and be my helper at the altar today, you are most welcome to come and be with us. Please stand. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Most High. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ, our Savior to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious God, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and creator of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is God, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day, Bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through our, your Son, Jesus Christ. By Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be peace. Christ invites you to this table. Come, taste and see. 
For those worshiping with us virtually today, let us now say together the prayer for spiritual communion. Gracious God, you stand at the door of our hearts and minds. You wait for us and reveal the end of We believe and trust in you, and ask you now to fill us with your presence. Nourish us with your body and unite us in your blood, that we may be your blessing to the world in you. Amen. stand. Karen and Candy, in the name of this congregation, I send you forth bearing these holy gifts to Maxine, that they may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body, because as we share the one bread and the one God. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us and as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for a few very brief announcements. If you're with us today for the first time at St. Luke and James, we are so glad you're here. This is only my third Sunday and people are really nice to me. They help me find the bathroom and the coffee hour. It's that way. Um, so just ask a neighbor, but we're so, so glad you're here. Um, I wanna give a special welcome to our brother in Christ, Father John Mitchell, who's back there. Will you give us a wave, John? Um, 
Father John is the rector at St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in North Minneapolis, where many of you know we are building relationships. Um, so I hope you will be normal friendly, not creepy friendly. <laughs> uh, we're so glad you're here. Yes. Uh, as Max said, when you go to coffee hour today, I hope you will take your coffee and your snacks and head to the memorial room to do a little bit of learning about how our congregational budget is structured so that as we do our discerning about who we are called to be in the future, you understand how our budget is structured and how those things get done. Um, lastly, you've seen me with a mask on today. We have fully entered cold flu season and we've been living in COVID season for a very long time. Um, if you have symptoms of any kind, you are more than welcome, just like I am doing today, to just put a mask on um, and elbow people instead of high-fiving or shaking hands. Um, that's one way that we can love each other as we continue to live into this mess of a relentless global pandemic. I don't detect any current additional announcements, except I do detect one. And if you weren't able to hear Carrie's announcement because it wasn't done into a microphone and you want more information about what's happening with St. James on the Parkway that you um, might have questions about, please make sure that you talk to Carrie at the coffee hour. Thank you. And here he is, our vestry member. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. On behalf of the vestry, uh, my name is Harry Monova. I'm the vestry at large. I just want to say thank you very much for worshiping with us today. If this is your first time, this should not be your last. And another thing I'd like to do, if you can please take a look in your bulletin, Vestry Corner. Um, if you have any report or like to make the Vestry, we'd like to hear from you. So as I said, again, on behalf of the Vestry, I just want to say welcome to St. Luke's and James. Thank you. My name is Renee Emerson, and I would like to confess that today I'm having a problem with my hat, so I need sympathy. Anyway, I just want to announce that we have released an elder profile, which is about Sarah Sivright, and you can pick one up and read it. We'd be delighted if you did, and I think it would improve your point of view. So, anyway. Barb is going to give the last word. Okay. Uh, we are in need of people to help with hospitality. You can recognize me by my hat. So come and see me and talk to me at, at Hospitality Hour. Thank you, Barb. Please stand. May God, who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen.